Hey everybody, it's Marcus with MLC CAD Systems, and today I'm going to show you a little bit of a simulation teaser. Uh, this problem is uh, one that I bring up at the end of a lot of my simulation classes to kind of reinforce some of the best practices and habits in post-processing, as well as to sort of highlight some of the problems you can get when you're dealing with FEA. They're inherent to the process, and just being aware of these could hopefully help you to diagnose some of your issues. So we'll start out by just looking at the setup. And so in this part, it's plain carbon steel fixed at one end, and then we have a torque at the other end, right on that end face. So we're not worried about the specific stress values, but we are worried about just intuitively looking at the results. So if we take a look at the stress results, you see that with a pure torque applied, we get bending. And that's definitely not what we're expected. That axial torque, we should expect to see this thing simply twist, and it's not twisting. So here's kind of a checklist that I do to go through a design and really make sure I fully understand what's going on. So the first one is to animate an exaggerated plot. So if I come in here and animate this, you can see uh, what's going on. It's very clearly bending primarily. And in this case, that is not intuitive, that is not correct. That is our first indication that there is a problem and we need to stop and fix this before we proceed or have any confidence in our result. Another thing that I typically will do, and this is something that I find helps me personally, uh, I, it's not necessarily a mathematical thing, but if I go into the settings of this plot and I change the boundary options to mesh, you'll see the mesh visually. And what I'm looking for here is mesh dependence, right? What we want is mesh independence, where the stresses don't seem to really follow the nodes and the points. But here, this node, these midpoint nodes, are very clearly impacting the color chart and the distribution of the stresses in this model. That indicates that this stress is probably not very accurate, and we have a problem. Now the other thing is the discretization in general. And this, this one has a very coarse mesh. So if you take a look at the end face especially, look how there's a really weird distribution. We got one really big node and then some other small ones around it to fill in the gaps. That is going to create a situation where the torque is discretized by surface area of the elements and because the elements have such a wide range of distribution and shape and size, they are going to really give us a bad discretization, an incorrect one, and give us incorrect values. Now there's a couple of other things you can do here. So for example, uh, you can come in and right click on the results folder and say list result force. And what that uh, helps you do is look at the entire model result force to see if you have a situation where what forces you have going in are not making it to the to the end or in this case notice we have some forces in the y and the z that really should not exist right we should see what is effectively zero in x because there are no forces that are unbalanced we only have torques now i can grab a, an axis to measure the torque and make sure the torque is being applied but first i want to figure out what's going on with this so let's go ahead and copy this study, and I'm gonna call this refined, because we do know that the mesh itself is a problem here. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new mesh. And for this one, you'll see, I really did type in a really horrible value for this, for this mesh. If I reset this to a more reasonable value, regardless of which mesher I choose, it should give me a much more reasonable mesh for this part. Now the reason why you might get the results that I showed earlier, right, I intentionally messed this up on a small part, but you might get that naturally when you have parts with really high aspect ratios. Tubular frames are a perfect example where you have a very high aspect ratio, so the discretization is going to be very coarse, you're not going to get all the elements you need, and it has the potential to mess up your stress values or your displacement values. Usually though, discretization like that is not going to cause this much of an error. This one is a really special case where it's extremely sensitive because I picked the end face rather than, for example, the shaft. Had I picked the shaft, 
discretization would have been much less sensitive uh, in creating the output. So let's run this study, see where we're at. I feel like this is going to give me a better result, but suddenly you'll see that it, it's now doing something very different. Now it's doing this growing thing. So again, we'll animate an exaggerated plot, and it looks like it is growing and shrinking. Very, very weird. So again, I'm going to turn on my uh, plot settings to make it a mesh boundary option. And by the way, there's it would have come across with those settings automatically, but it uh, it didn't copy them. There's some new options in this version that allows you to tell it not to copy all the results, and I, I must have picked the wrong one. But let's go ahead and animate this, and when I animate this, I'm actually going to slow it down. And let's take a look at the end face here. And if I pause it, all right, let's take a look here. So I've got this node. I'm going to look at this node right here. And that node, I want to see where it goes, right? So we'll put a dot there, and then we will kind of hit play. Let's see if I can pause it at a different place. Pause it here. And what we're going to hopefully see is that that point at the various different locations, right, is... Uh, going in a straight line. Now, that's to be expected because this is a linear study. Linear static studies move in straight lines. But this motion, the expected motion, is a curve. Now, if you take the linear extrapolation of a curved motion, that is going to create what is effectively a larger diameter. And that's what's going on here. In fact, you can see, if I animate right here, you can see very clearly that we are uh, twisting. The diametral change is really just about uh, that extrapolation of the linear values. So again, this is a really obvious and almost cartoonishly uh, you know, exaggerated example where mathematically we have some you know, weird results. If I wanted to, I could run this in a nonlinear study and it would give me much more intuitive results, but these are not wrong. These are just sort of illustrating assumptions. So one thing I could do to fix this or to improve this anyways visually is to go back to a true scale or make it a much smaller scale. And now you can see the stresses make sense, right? They, and the displacement values would too, even if they were uh, not exaggerated quite as much, but it doesn't look silly, right? So we kind of have uh, a little bit better result. Uh, simulation is all about, you know, answering questions and demonstrating, visualizing results. And you don't want to have to visualize something that is really just a mathematical artifact. All right, a couple more things. So we look at the stresses here. Again, the stresses appear to be very mesh dependent. So if we look, you can see that this highest stress is right on the midpoint nodes and that it dips down for no reason other than the mesh changes geometry or changes orientations at that place. So a couple more things you want to do. Now that I have intuitive results, now that I feel like the results are at least, you know, giving me you know, uh, directly accurate behavior or response, now I have to make sure that the stress results are accurate. So a couple ways you could do that. One of the ways you can do that is to define a stress plot, but to use a very special stress value called the energy norm error. And I came back to my other, my first one, just to show you how bad it can get. In this case, the energy norm error is 92 at its worst. 92 means that it is 92% error. <laughs> the stresses are horribly wrong. This is very, very inaccurate. Uh, and if you want to see a little bit about that, here's 1.1 times 10 to the sixth in a nodal distribution. But if I was to come in here and change this to be, instead of nodal, it would be elemental. It's 
Now instead of 1.1 E6, it's 7.6 E5. Very different value because the way you measure, right, in a node or in a, in a uh, element changes. So you can kind of think of it like the difference between city elections, county elections, state elections, and national, right? That same vote count will be matched up with a grouping that is different based on each of the voting districts. And you could see some really wide variation uh, if you had, for example, a very liberal city in a very rural uh, conservative uh, area, right? The values would change between the city and the county elections. So that difference is kind of what the energy norm error is, is showing. So 92% when we had the really bad mesh. Now if we come over here to this one and take a look at the energy norm error, we're looking at still a very high number, 85. Right. So let's do this. Let's uh, duplicate this study again or copy the study again. And we'll say include the results and the mesh. And for this one, we're going to say adaptive because if you are looking to get your stress results as accurate as possible one way to do that is to turn on the adaptive solver H adaptive meshes and remeshes the study over and over again until you reach a threshold accuracy in this case 98 percent and I'm going to tell it hey give it about five runs and let's just see what it does and it's going to go through and solve this study and then areas where the energy norm error is high it will refine those elements in that specific area and then keep going okay so now it's telling me it's it's satisfied the accuracy of 98 percent but now let's see what our stresses are six times ten to the fifth it's very different than it was in the previous study now do we feel confident in these results well the fact that you've got these little splotches here on a part that should be completely uniform in distribution of the stresses, that doesn't bode well for my confidence in these results. And for those of you that have taken FEA training or are familiar with it, you may recognize this situation as a singularity. That is a sharp internal corner. Normally you'll see these in tension causing this, but in shear, that sharp internal corner can still cause some serious issues. I don't feel great about this result simply because it just looks splotchy. It might actually be really close, right? And depending on how bad the factor safety is or something like that, that might change things. But let's do this. Let's copy it one more time. And this one we're going to say no sharp. And all we're going to do for this one is we are going to add a very small fillet. So this very small fillet, say 0.01 or 0.02, something like that. This very small fillet is coming over here to kind of break up that sharp internal core. Because in reality, it's never going to be completely sharp like that. And even if it is, it will deform slightly and create a fillet on its own. So let's run this again. And what this should do is leave that adaptive mesh routine on and it's going to go through and remesh and remesh and remesh and we're going to hopefully see it start to converge to a very specific result. So now we're at 98%. We're at 7.1 times 10 to the fifth. The results are probably still pretty splotchy, but notice they didn't change all that much from where they were before. Uh, again, depending on how close we are to the factor of safety. So I might want to go in and individually remesh this thing. I may also want to come in and turn off uh, the, the adaptive methodology and just add a mesh control manually. So that was a 30 thousandths mesh. Let's say we want to create a really fine mesh. That's 60 thousandths. Let's do 30 thousandths but with a growth ratio of 1.2. Let's see what that does. And really what we're doing is we're just exploring the various different options to try to figure out which one is going to give us the good results, or we're going to do it until we feel confident in our results.
the variation in stresses has not changed dramatically. And if this is supposed to truly be a sharp internal corner, uh, this is probably about right. So now we're still 6.9 times 10 to the fifth. Uh, it's still a tiny bit splotchy, but not bad. If I continue on this way, you're going to see I'm continuing to really stay in a pretty tight window. So I feel confident that this is finally my correct answer. All right, I didn't need to do every individual step along the way, but hopefully that was illustrative of kind of the, the traps that you can fall into when dealing with a mathematical solution such as finite element analysis and some of the procedures and habits to get into to help you make sure that you um, have a good understanding of what's going on, you identify issues, you clearly understand what types of inputs you've given that are providing that output, and that you can confidently reach the final result.